Hello everyone and welcome to today's video in our series on the gamma function. And this video is going to bring together the results from two of my earlier videos. And we're going to show that the two different ways that we've derived the gamma function so far, first as an infinite product and then as an integral, we're going to show that these two forms of the gamma function are actually equivalent to each other. So the agenda for today's video is very straightforward. I'm going to review those two forms of the gamma function, again, the infinite product form and the integral form, and that they, these two definitions don't seem to have much to do with each other. But we're actually going to show that the infinite product form of the gamma function and the integral definition, these two forms are actually equivalent. They get the same result. So let's first take a step back and recall what the gamma function is. The gamma function is developed as a way of extending the concept of the factorial to the domain of inputs beyond just the positive integers. So it can include non-positive integer inputs as well, with the exception of negative integers. And it's defined so that gamma, that's the Greek letter gamma of n, actually equals n minus 1 factorial. And this definition is valid for all n except for 0 and the negative integers. So when the great mathematician Leonard Euler first discovered the function, which we now know as the gamma function, he defined it first as the limit of an infinite product. And so based on this definition, we would write get n equals n minus 1 factorial, which equals the limit as m, not n, m approaches infinity, of m factorial times m plus 1 to the n all over n times n plus 1 times n plus 2, dot, 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 all the way up to n plus m times n plus m plus 1, and I'll just extend uh, uh, that line there. Okay, so that's the Euler infinite product definition for the gamma function. And we can simplify this a little bit. This was a simplification due to Gauss. He said this equals the limit as p approaches infinity of p factorial, to p to the n over n times n plus 1 times n plus 2, dot, 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 all the way up to n plus p. And I show how that's derived in uh, my earlier video on the infinite product form for the gamma function. So that's the Gauss form. Now, if I want this infinite product to equal n factorial, I just multiply both sides by n. And so I get n factorial on the left side, and on the right-hand side, those two n's cancel out. And that gives us the Gauss infinite product form for the factorial function. But there's another way that we could define the gamma function and the factorial function. We found, through alternative means, the following integral form for that function. We found gamma of n, which again equals n minus 1 factorial, equals the integral from infinity to 0 of the function t to the n minus 1 times e to the negative t dt. So we can also write, if we want to look at this as a factorial function, n factorial equals the integral from infinity to 0 of t to the n times e to the negative t dt. And we derived this integral through completely different means than what we use to find the infinite product form of the gamma function and factorial functions. So we now need to show how these two very different expressions are actually equal to each other. So to show that these two definitions are equivalent, we have to go back to the way that we derived the integral form of the gamma function. And that derivation actually began with studying a related integral and that related integral is of the form, the integral from 1 to 0 of x to the c, c is a constant, times 
parenthesis 1 minus x close parenthesis to the n, also a constant, dx. And we showed that in general, this integral equals n factorial over c plus 1 times c plus 2, dot, 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 all the way up to c plus n plus 1. So, for the sake of clarity in this video, I'm going to rename those constants c and n. So, I'm going to change the letter n here to p, and I'm going to change the letter c to n. So, I haven't done anything mathematically so far, I've just relabeled those constants. And now we're going to do a clever substitution in the integral on the left-hand side. We're going to let t equal p times x, therefore x will equal t over p, and then dt dx will equal p, and therefore 1 over p dt equals dx. Now let's check the effect of this variable substitution on our bounds of integration. When x equals 0, p times 0 will equal 0, and when x equals 1, p times 1 will equal p. So the integral becomes the integral from p to 0 of t over p, x equals t over p, so t over p to the n times 1 minus, again, t over p for x here, 1 minus t over p to the p. And for dx, we write times 1 over p dt. And that integral will then equal p factorial over n plus 1 times n plus 2 times dot 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 all the way up to n plus p plus 1. So let's bring that equation to the top of the page. And then the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite t over p close parenthesis to the n. I'm just going to rewrite that as t to the n over p to the n. And then to simplify the left-hand side of this equation, I'm going to multiply both sides by p to the n times p. So I'm multiplying the left side by p to the n times p and the right side by p to the n times p. And then when I do that, the p to the n's cancel in the integral and the p's cancel in the integral. And I'm left with the integral from p to 0 of t to the n times 1 minus t over p close parenthesis, quantity to the power of p, dt, and that will equal p factorial times p to the n times p, all over n plus 1 times n plus 2, dot dot dot, times n plus p plus 1. And now we're going to take the limit as p approaches infinity on both sides of the equation. So this is really cool. We'll take the limit as p goes to infinity on the left, and the limit as p goes to infinity on the right-hand side. But remember, the limit as p approaches infinity for the expression 1 minus t over p to the p, that just equals e to the negative t by the definition of e. So we can write the integral from infinity to 0 of t to the n times e to the negative t dt equals the limit as p approaches infinity of p factorial times p to the n times p all over n plus 1 times n plus 2, dot, dot, dot. And now I'm going to write the penultimate term times n plus p and then times n plus p plus 1. And now I'm going to make another cosmetic change. Just for instructive purposes, I'm going to write that last term in the numerator p over the last term in the denominator, n plus p plus 1. I'm going to just treat that as a separate fraction, multiplying the rest of this expression. And now we'll look at what happens as p approaches infinity. 
the term p over n plus p plus 1 equals 1 for any fixed value of n. So that just equals 1. I'm going to cancel it out of that expression. And now look what we have. On the left-hand side, we have the integral form of the factorial function. And on the right-hand side, we have the Gauss infinite product form of the factorial function. So both of these expressions are equal to n factorial. So let's move that expression to the top of the screen. And now to get the gamma function out of these two expressions, I just change n in the integral on the left-hand side to n minus 1. And on the right-hand side, I just divide the entire expression by n. So that gives me n minus 1 factorial, or equivalently, gamma of n. So we've shown that these two different expressions for the gamma function, the integral form and the infinite product form, which we derived through very different means, are in fact equivalent. Well, that does it for today. If you enjoyed this video, please like or subscribe, and thanks for watching. See you next time.